Car chases are often the selling point of a major film when included. They are commonly used to get the audience pumped and are a great spectre of entertainment when done right with their stunts and high speed action. They can also be a great showcase for some amazing cars used and modified to perform these chases. MFP presents 10 lesser known and forgotten car chase movies. They steal a super stalker and tell the world to eat my dust. As part of a two picture deal with Roger Corman's production company, Ron Howard came off the success of Happy Days and would go on to star in two of his action comedy car chase movies, the second of which, Grand Theft Auto, was accepted with the offer to allow Howard to make his directorial debut. The first film was to be 1976's Eat My Dust, the story of the son of a town sheriff who decides to steal a race car to impress a girl, leading to his father to send out the law to get back the stolen racer and his son. Darlene is in the fast cars, Hoover is in the Darlene! <laughs> Though mostly shot with a body double, with Ron who reportedly only shot for 10 days in the four week production schedule, Eat My Dust had a $300,000 budget and a box office success of $5 million. The film became Corman's biggest hit at the time, and would lead to him agreeing to Howard's request in allowing him to direct the follow-up, as the film succeeding was part of the requirement to give Howard control of the next film. With amazing display of practical action and stunts, the film would focus around a stolen bright orange 1968 race prep Chevy Camaro named Mabel. Though not fully confirmed, the 68 Camaro likely had a 396 L78 big block Chevy V8 engine that powered the racer and led it to be taken for the ultimate ride in this low budget action comedy. With the low budget independent hit that was the original Gone in 60 Seconds, actor stunt driver HB Toby Hiliki would make a follow up in this semi autobiographical film called The Junk Man that tells the story of a stuntman turned successful filmmaker who is involved in an assassination attempt to kill him after a bitter partner in his company employs Hitman to do so as car carnage ensues. The film plays as an almost loose sequel to Gone in 60 Seconds as it features the original Eleanor and the film is referred to several times and the car scene briefly driven once again. One of the film's inclusions is that of the over the top heavy use of slow motion as a number of the stunts and crashes within the film are shown as such to sell the reality of the carnage on screen, which at the time for over 20 years held the Guinness World Record for most car crashes of the film with over 150 cars demolished. The stars of this film that would gain the most focus however, would be a yellow 1981 Chevrolet Corvette C3 Stingray with a 350 cubic inch L81 engine and a red 1974 Brickland SV1 with a 351 Ford Windsor motor, which in Haliki fashion, both cars would be shown on screen smashed to a metal pulp. Anyone can enter and anything goes in a squealing, smashing outlaw race across America. Another part of the Roger Corman production car chase films made in the 1970s, Cannibal had taken the then popular illegal coast to coast race idea of the Cannibal Baker Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash and turned it into a low budget film starring David Carradine and several other Corman alumni. Not to be confused with the later Burt Reynolds action comedy 80s road movies, Cannibal was less upbeat and more gritty, not least due to its typical Corman low budget production style and more violent storyline. Featuring a number of popular muscle cars, including two red Pontiac 1970-73 Trans Ams and later a green 1969 Ford Mustang set in the movie to have a 427 block engine with 600 horsepower though shown to appear more likely to be a Chevy V8 and not a Ford. This Mustang would be seen going head to head with a black 1968 Dodge Charger as a homage to the chase from Steve McQueen's Bullet. This film itself was quickly forgotten and left no real impact on the film industry at all, though it has gathered a number of fans over the years, the Cannonball Race concept would prove more successful with later film incarnations of the race such as the Cannonball Run that brought a level of fun into the idea that was missing from this installment. Cannonball. He learned about cars, running whiskey in the Carolina Hills. Taking on the established stories of moonshine runners in the American South, as a number of other films had done before, The Last American Hero is loosely based on the real-life bootleg runner turned stock car driver Junior Johnson, who was also a technical advisor for the film, as he makes his way from country town lawbreaker to race car American champion. Starring a young Jeff Bridges playing Junior Jackson in one of his earliest roles along with Gary Busey, the Last American Hero featured a variety of different driving scenes within its running time, from country back road dirt police chasing, to smash demolition derbies and NASCAR racing. Starting off with a black 1967-68 Ford Mustang fastback with what appears to be a 390 V8 he uses to run moonshine and start off his racing career, 
Jackson would work his way up to a 1970 red and gold Chevrolet Monte Carlo with the 427 big block V8 motor, supplied by NASCAR legend Bobby Allison. The last American hero still holds up as a great tribute to the Southern race car legends of the past and a capsule of a time fondly remembered within racing. Jeff Bridges, the last American hero. Arriving in 1971 along with the more popular car chase movie Vanishing Point, Tulane Blacktop is another cross-country car film that focuses on the freedom of driving. However, unlike Vanishing Point that follows the law in pursuit of a criminal storyline, Blacktop is a film that focuses on two cars and their drivers as they venture off onto the highways and byways of America and those they meet along the way. The main car is a 1955 souped-up Chevy 150 with a 454 big block that would later be reused in the 1973 classic American Graffiti and is customised for drag racing as its driver, played by legendary country singer James Taylor, travels from state to state along with his mechanic and female hitchhiker. Along the way they encounter a yellow 1970 Pontiac GTO with the 455 cubic inch Mark IV Ram Air, with its driver played by Warren Oates, whose character is simply referred to as GTO in the credits, and it represents an older generation of car man as he and the younger group in the Chevy cross paths constantly as they both travel across America together for different reasons. Another street race movie, King of the Mountain follows the typical formula of a younger street racer wanting to be the best of his class as he takes on all who would challenge him in this 1981 forgotten gem. Unlike a number of other films, the chase in this movie takes place on a mountain road in the Los Angeles area where the action deals more with the dangers of the road and less on speed. Starring Harry Hamlin and Dennis Hopper, who plays a free-spirited type character as he has done in other films, who is obsessed with speed and his vehicle. King of the Mountain features a 1967 Stingray Corvette C2 with what is thought to be another 427 Chevy V8 and a Porsche 356 Speedster replica along with several other vehicles. One of the biggest letdowns of the film is most of the racing is shot at night and are not well lit as it would have been with today's technology as the lack of daylight takes away too much of the action of the film. Only towards the end with the final chase between the Stingray and the Porsche replica set at dawn do we get to see one of the film's best examples of its mountain racing as we get a number of great overhead shots along with the feeling of danger given the tight winding road of the mountain. A film whose popularity grew after several mentions in both his films and in person by director Quentin Tarantino. Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, although almost formulaic in being similar to a few other police chase movies of the time, would tell the story of a pair of robbers and a female acquaintance take part in a police chase that results in a number of high impact stunts and driving scenes. Starring Peter Fonda as the getaway driver and Vic Murrow as the officer in pursuit, Dirty Mary Crazy Larry is one of the few instances where two different vehicles are used as the getaway car of choice in a chase film. The first, a blue 1966, wrongfully mentioned as a 68 in the film Chevy Impala, thought to be a 327 small block V8 based on some of the badges labelled on the car. While the second is a highlight green 1969 Dodge Charger RT that briefly switches inexplicably to a 1968 model in one scene, which carries a 440 Magnum engine. Although earning over $28 million on a $2 million budget, making the film a success, one of the contributing factors that may have led to the film's lack of notoriety over the years when compared to other films of that era may have stemmed from the lack of appeal or empathy for the fleeing robbers and the passenger as the audience sided more with Vic Moreau's Captain Franklin pursuing them. He's a booze running, motor gunning, law breaking. One of Burt Reynolds' earliest good old boy roles, Reynolds would play Gator McCluskey in this 1973 action thriller, featuring some great stunt driving in Hollywood at the time, as the story revolves around a former moonshine runner looking to seek revenge for his brother's murder by a local sheriff in his hometown. Driving a 1971 Ford Custom 500 with a 429 V8 motor, a lot of the action takes place at high speed in the old country back roads of the south with stuntman Hal Needham doubling for Reynolds in a number of the more dangerous scenes. One stunt in particular in this film performed that was so dangerous was the barge jump, where while escaping his pursuers, McCluskey jumps his car onto a moving barge that was supposed to land on a mound of dirt. However, the car fell short in its attempt and landed on the back of the barge with half of the car falling into the water as well. The stunt was not repeated and left as is in the final product, along with the infamous stunt where Burt Reynolds himself stood next to his car at the bottom of a hill while the police car pursuing would jump overhead and into a river. Yeah! 
After the success of Mad Max and Mad Max 2, the Australian cinema surprisingly did not venture as much into the road movie genre as would have been expected. One film that did get released, however, was 1982's illegal street racing movie known as Running on Empty that was released as Fast Lane Fever in the US. Running on Empty shared a similar story with Two Lane Blacktop as we see a young driver and his mechanic take part in illegal drag racing across country along with a female companion. Originally starting with what was described to be a Phase 3 XY GTHO with a 351 Ford Cleveland V8 engine with added nitrous in the movie, which according to sources, the producers did obtain along with several other standard XYs, this was one of the few times this model would feature prominently in an Australian film, as this particular model vehicle now sells for over a million Australian dollars at auction and is highly sought after. The other vehicles featured in this film were a 1970 Dodge Challenger with a 440 Magnum engine and a blown 57 Chevy 150, the later of which would become the hero replacement car after the Falcon was destroyed and used for the final race. Part of the film's appeal was in the representation of Australian car culture that was on par in a lot of respects with that of the American market, as Australians in the 1970s and 80s had embraced their own muscle car era that is still going on to this day. At number one is a one-of-a-kind car movie like no other on this list. Although only a short film, Rendezvous was conceived by famed French director Claude Lelouch, the idea of which was to attach a camera onto the front of a car as he would sprint illegally across the city of Paris. In order to achieve this, Lelouch chose to perform this stunt early at the break of dawn and in August when the city would be at its quietest and with the least traffic due to the French holiday season. Having no permits and no form of police traffic control, Lelouch decided to do all the driving on the fly. However, one to two sites en route proved to be too risky with the higher possibility of causing an accident. Crew members were placed at certain intersections with headsets in order to alert Lelouch in the speeding car if another vehicle were approaching at the same time to avoid any accidents and abort his attempt. The director would later state in interviews that the radios had failed and had there been a need for contact, none would have been able to be made and a serious accident would have taken place. The film was completed in one take and filmed in just over 8 minutes, travelling the distance of roughly 10.6 kilometres, 6.6 miles. Although advertising on its poster and sound design suggested that the vehicle used for the film was a 1967 Ferrari 275, it had since been revealed that Lelouch actually used his Mercedes-Benz 450 SEL 6.9 litre V8 as the car to race across the streets of Paris. At the screening of the film, once the footage had been shown, director Claude Lelouch was arrested for reckless driving and endangerment after he refused to reveal who was driving the vehicle, though the charges were later dropped. This film has gone on to garner a cult following as it represents a time and situation when a famed director was willing to break the law in order to get the film he wanted in a major European city that would almost be impossible to replicate in this day and age as it had been done in the past and in an era when car chases in movies were being done as real as possible. If you like this video, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button in order to help this channel grow and to bring you more content like this one as your support is what keeps this channel going.